afternoon. Uh, always easy to talk uh, once you've had a lot of food. Um, but I'm always very happy to come back to Manila. I've been here a couple of times. I've spoken at the CAS conferences run by ISACA. I've spoken at the ISOC conferences. And uh, it literally feels like home because, you know, we have the same rains in Mumbai. I, I, I'm born and brought up in Mumbai city in India. You have the same traffic. You sweat the same. Yeah, so you, you very much feel at home here in Manila. And, and, and people are uh, both the sides of the world. I think people are very friendly and, you know, able to talk to all of them very nicely. I'm going to talk to you about identities and diversity in humanity. And this is a very interesting topic that people have been talking to you about for the last one day, I'm sure. Uh, people would have come and spoken about solutions. I'm not going to speak to you about any solution. What I'm trying to talk to you about today is fundamentally as identities and digital identities where we are and what is expected of a digital identity revolution, as may I call it, uh, in the next maybe five years. So let us just take a step back and imagine digital identities. And when you imagine, let's try and imagine them five years from now and maybe 20 years from then. And I call the first age of the first five years as evolution of digital identities, right? I'm sure all of you have heard about it so much that by now you would probably imagine that digital identities are already here. But believe me, digital identities have nothing to do with user IDs and passwords. That's the perception that we carry. They have nothing, nothing to do with user IDs and passwords. So what are these digital identities? Again, if you take a step back for a couple of minutes and reimagine this, you would probably realize that digital identities are nothing but your personal thoughts. Digital identities are nothing but your likes and dislikes. Digital identities are nothing like but you, how you do things, or when you do things, where you do things. What is it that actually you do in terms of your professional life? What is it that you do in your personal life and where you store data? All of these attributes and many more actually constitute a digital identity, which is nothing but the you in you, right? So it literally mirrors a person that you are. And eventually, all of us are likely to have this digital avatar. We already started to have these digital avatars in the internet world. Now, I would want to take a stop from the digital identities and talk to you about a couple of minutes on evolving business models across the world, right? And this is very, very important because as CISOs or CIOs or technology managers, eventually one has to understand what are the business models which are evolving in the world. And the first one that is evolving is an outcome-based business model. Have you heard about outcome-based business model? What it really means is that you're no longer buying something for the sake of buying something. So let me take an example which is so famous. You now no longer want to buy a car because a car looks good, because a car runs faster. You want to buy a car because a car engages with you, you know, because it's able to take you safely where you want to go without even having to drive a car. And that is why the value of Tesla is more than a trillion dollars, not because it's a, not because it's a revolution in batteries and optimization of fuel. It is because the cars start engaging with you. You go to hospitals in the next maybe a couple of years, it'll start engaging with you, which means even before you enter into a hospital, the hospital already knows what is wrong with you and be able to then inject exactly what you would have to do to probably get well soon. You walk into shopping malls today, you're already starting to experience the fact that, hey, you know what, Anil, you've not been to this mall for the last six months. Why don't I give you 50% discount on anything and everything that you buy today? That is an experience again. Uh, the second model that is evolving across the world is hyper-personalization. If you go to US, for example, you should be able to buy a Nike shoes the way you like it. For example, if you wanted to buy in a red color with a Nike logo coming in a black color, you may want to buy it that way. You have an 11.5. It is able to construct a shoe exactly of what your size is, what you wanted. You'll be able to construct the music going forward the way you like it. Maybe, maybe you don't like slow music, but maybe you like slow music towards the end of the music, for example, towards the end of the song, for example. So you'll be able to do all of this. Hyper-personalization is even coming through professionalism today, professional services. Hyper-personalization is coming in ID security, and that's what I'm going to talk about in the next couple of slides. The, the third one is access versus ownership. I repeat, access versus ownership. Any and every business model which is emerging in the world today is actually people don't want to own assets. People want to enjoy assets. And you understand this better than anybody else in the world today because everything happens to be in cloud. You don't own an asset in cloud. You enjoy or you access the asset in cloud. Right? Uber is a fantastic example. Airbnb is a fantastic example. I think all the examples that you see today in the world is broadly 
access and not ownership. And if you go to Dubai, for example, I have a lot of friends from Philippines who happen to be in Dubai. It's a fantastic example of a SaaS service. As a country, you're allowed to stay there, do whatever you want to do, enjoy the assets, but never own a single asset. Right, so, so I'm saying all of these examples are so, so interesting. All of this is possible because of digitalization of businesses. And if you were to box the digitalization of businesses and the models, you'll be able to box them in three big boxes. The first one, investment in growth. So for example, if you're doing digital investment, it is actually because you're enabling growth for your organization. The second box is you're doing digital investment because you want to create efficiency. And the third box is you're doing digital investment because you want to create experience in your organization. So if you're working for a company and you're part of the ID security operations or a CIO, you would put digital assets in one of these three boxes, right? And if you were to then try and look at it from a business perspective, it could be investment in the front office, middle office, or the back office. If it is the front office, it could be integration with WhatsApp solutions. If it is a middle office, it could be integration with risk management solutions. I don't know if you've heard about uh, usage-based insurance, for example. You know, you charge insurance only when you drive the car. For example, in Mumbai City, if you go to a particular location, you would actually, you would actually dent your car, right? So maybe the insurance on that day is going to be $5 for you. If your driver drives the car, maybe the insurance is going to be $10 because his background is not very good. So you're getting into all of those use cases where you put digital assets and investments in place. And you may want to do auto underwriting, for example, for use cases which are very, very simple. Now, the last thing that I want to talk to you about around the business model is everything is changing. Telecommunication is no longer a business of voice or data. Telecommunication is a business of content. One of the largest organizations in India uh, the owner, um, uh, Gio, Mr. Ambani, came up on the dais and said, Telcom uh, is no longer a business of data. Uh, it is actually a business of content. I want to give you data free. I want to give you voice free. Initially, when it started 20 years back, you used to be charged a lot of money for data, and then for vast services, then for voice services. But today, I think telecommunication companies are nothing but infrastructure companies. You've bought the pipe. You've taken a license from the government you run what you want to run on that. So it's going to become more and more closure to OTT platforms and content platforms. If you look at banks, banks are likely to be more API driven going forward. So you have huge FinTech companies coming up across the world, including in Philippines, and it's likely to be completely, completely FinTech. If you have travel, you have more aggregators. And if you have power, power is likely to be generated by people like you and me, and it's going to be injected back into the national grid, and every piece of technology in a power company is likely to change. What is likely to change? Meters are likely to change and they're likely to become net metering. Your CRM solutions are likely to change because you are producing power. Your CRM systems and accounting systems can hold vendors, which is maybe 100,000, 200,000. But now, millions of customers are actually producing power. So millions of vendors have come back, right? Earlier, if your call center was down, it was okay. But today, if your call center is down, it is not okay because you're producing power and you're losing money. So what I'm trying to tell you guys, ladies and gentlemen, is consumers are becoming producers. And why am I talking about all of these business models to you today? Anybody? All of them are related, whether you like it or not, back to identities and who we are. Consumers, we are. We are becoming producers. And that is all connected back to identities. We believe that we spend money in identities because we want to protect and access control. Identities are actually meant for growth, written on investment. Last slide on this, the risk paradigm is completely changing. And I'm not sure if there's anybody from the risk world here, but if you look at the risk today, governance was supposed to mitigate risk. Governance is actually a risk parameter today. Why? Because the new threat actor is investors, customers, and consumers. Investors are becoming so aggressive, right? Investors want to take you to court. If you look at strategy and planning, most of us invest money in technology. Technology is available today because SaaS platforms are available. You can actually create a bank with a very small amount today, which you could not do maybe 10 years before. That is also a threat because there are young banks coming up which will dislodge the larger banks. The compliance is becoming a risk today. Compliance was never risk. Compliance was supposed to mitigate risk. Compliance is becoming a risk because if you don't comply with even a small order of a central bank or a regulator, you're blown away across the world, right? There is no borders today. 
And reporting is becoming a risk today. If you have a small error in a report, the CEO actually has to come to the stage and say, hey, you know what? Our apologies, we made a mistake in reporting. Can you imagine that? That was not there before. That will not be even part of your risk management system today. So we are living in a hyperly converged world. Now let us talk about, let us talk about maybe 20 years from now. We spoke about five years from now. Let's talk about 20 years from now. And, and the way that I look at 20 years from now is uh, slightly more interesting and dramatic. But assume that you're sleeping one day in the morning and your watch, which is a smart watch, actually connects to a Google map and finds out that, hey, today the traffic is good. Traffic in Manila is horrendous, right? But today the traffic is good, which means let this gentleman sleep for the next 20 minutes more. But after 20 minutes, it actually nudges your bed, and the bed actually nudges you because the watch talks to the sensor in the bed. And the time that you get up, you stand in front of a mirror, the mirror actually scans your body and tells you, hey, you know what, you've partied a lot, go and run for 20 minutes extra. So the mirror talks to your treadmill to run 20 minutes more. By the time you finish your treadmill, it talks to your geezer, saying that you know he needs a 20 minute, 20 degree hot water bath. And by the time you finish the geezer, it talks to the coffee machine to say he likes cappuccino with less, maybe milk or less sugar. And by the time the coffee machine finishes, you come on your dining table, the news is there. And by the time you finish your breakfast, it talks to the car to take you to the office exactly where you want to go. And by the time the car takes you, it talks to all the bots in your office to say, finish all the job that you're supposed to do and put all the reports on the table. Does that sound dramatic? All of these technologies that I'm talking about is already there. They are already there. They're just getting intertwined. They're getting, they're getting available to be delivered, maybe not in exactly the same sequence that I spoke to you about. Again, why am I trying to talk to you about all of this in an identity and a cloud and a governance or a security perspective? Anybody, any idea? The watch that logs on to Google and checks whether they would, it would want you to take to office knows the attribute of my identity, which is Anil. The mirror, which scans you, knows the attribute of the identity, which is Anil. The treadmill, which is making you walk for 20 minutes more, knows the attribute, which is Anil. The, the hot water geezer knows it. But it is slightly more even complex than what it is. The watch talks to the sensor on the bed, which has got a machine identity. The sensor talks to the mirror, which has got a machine identity. And the mirror talks to a treadmill, which has got a machine identity. So you are literally sitting on a bomb in terms of having identities and managing machine identities and human identities and bots and all of that. We are still struggling to manage API credentials. And we are still struggling with a lot of other things that we have. Interestingly, every piece of data that is likely to get generated will have to be in the cloud. Why does it have to be in the cloud? It has to be in the cloud because the models run better with large sets of data. The models don't run good with smaller sets of data, right? So because you would have large sets of data only in the cloud with the computing power, all of the data that you generate will be sitting in the cloud. And of course, the business models, essentially the outcome based, they would start using the cloud data to probably do what they have to do the best. And finally, data is like water. I repeat, data is like water. The more you put inside a piece of data, it changes the context of the data, right? And the context of the data when it was generated may be different, and what you're protecting the next time could be completely different from what you have. So data is literally like water. And the interesting piece is we still struggle with the basics. We still sometimes worry about what is the definition of privileged identities whether we can onboard all the backend users or just the root accounts. Does, how does one manage the life cycle of bots, which you're likely to see? How does one manage the life cycle of APIs and credentials within the APIs? And how does one manage the hard-coded passwords? I mean, we are struggling with the basic problems that we have today. And we even struggle to get it right. And organizations, you know what? Since yesterday, I'm sure you would have heard about tools and technologies and solutions. And you would have probably invested in IAM solutions, a PAM solution. I think it is time for us to be able to help ourselves to triangulate what is it that we're likely to see in terms of data contextual element rather than doing a simple solution to a problem statement that one would have. What do we need to do? We need to actually take our organizations through a digital risk assessment. Digital risk assessment is not IT security assessment. It is not IT operations assessment. It is a very different animal than you can see today. 
triangulate the use cases and create a universe of identity, the types of identity, identities to enable business should be your mindset and not security should be only your mindset. And if you were to look at the global trends today, you would probably realize what I'm talking about. And the global trends today are saying, while they're saying what they're saying, there are two themes which are appearing on the bottom. And the two themes which are appearing is identity threat detection and response. That's one trend which is coming up. It's no longer going to be just identity and access management. And the second trend which is coming is digital supply chain integrity. Let's not talk about digital supply chain integrity. The first one, I think, is a very important trend to watch because it impacts all of us, including the consumer identities that you would have. I will not take you through the stories of how they've been misused and what has been misused. All of us are aware, even the likes of Okta has been hit, even the likes of One Login has been hit. So you would also start getting hit in the way that you were not expecting to get hit around your identities. Just wanted to end this, um, since I have only a couple of minutes more now, just by, I wanted to end this by saying that Archon as an organization understands and realizes the sequence of problems that we have and we are investing millions and millions of dollars to try and create our data contextual framework to help you create and triangulate an identity-centric security, if one would like to call it. And we have invested in tools to expand um, all the way, including the cloud entitlements and governance that one would like to do. Because you have millions and millions of assets coming up in the cloud, and it could be different clouds. It could be AWSs, it could be Googles, and all of that. And sometimes you don't even realize what you have. So, we have triangulated it very well to be able to respond back and come back and say what is right or wrong. And here is the data contextual layer that I was talking to you about, right? It squeezes, the solution squeezes every portion of data that you have, puts it on an AIML box, and is able to come back and define exactly who you are, what you do, with the data that you're working on. Maybe you're working in a lawyer's office. Maybe you work with power of attorneys every day. We know exactly what you're doing. And if you know exactly what you're doing, you can be followed and the data can be followed and hey, this is where you want to be after five years. You want to answer the question of your CEO and the board, who has the most important data in your organization? Do we have an answer today? We don't have an answer today. We can't respond and have an answer. Who's got the most important? Do you want to spend millions of dollars trying to protect maybe, maybe a receptionist? Maybe not. Of course, the job is important, but maybe the data is not important. And it is possible that the data that you have and I have could be the same, but contextually, you may need to protect it, but I may not need to protect that data. So it's very important for you to look at something like this. And finally, the model which is emerging in the world is identity threat detection and response. I'm happy to let you know that based on our investment, we tick almost all the boxes that are there. So it's been fantastic to be here in Manila talking to you and talking to you about identities, which are diversity in humanity, which is what we are. Um, I don't know, I hope I've been able to explain the fundamentals of what is likely to emerge in the world, but otherwise it's always, always a pleasure to be back in Manila. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. Pleasure. Once again, a big thanks to Mr. Anil Bandari for their wonderful...